The last time I made a fully-fledged 2020 Democrat video was probably in September or October of last year. Since then, many new players have emerged. In due time, I'll talk about Andrew Yang and Beto O'Rourke and a few other people. However, there is one person I feel that I have to cover before any of them because his campaign is already over, and despite his lack of success, Richard Ojeda is still someone who deserves our attention and is someone who I think will have a bright future, even if that future does not involve the White House. So let's take a look at Richard Ojeda and his 2020 presidential campaign. Despite spending most of his life in West Virginia, Richard Ojeda was actually born in Rochester, Minnesota on September 25th, 1970. His grandfather was an undocumented immigrant from Mexico who gained citizenship after going to West Virginia to mine coal. Another of his grandfathers, presumably his maternal grandfather, fought in World War II, but then came home and died in a mining accident not long after. Ojeda's father was a nurse who administered anesthesia. Ojeda was raised to be an ardent, lifelong Democrat. He said something to the effect of the word Republican being an insult in his high school. After he graduated high school, he said that as a West Virginian, his choices were mining, selling dope, or joining the Army. Famously, Ojeda chose to join the U.S. Army. Around the age of 18, right after graduating high school, Ojeda enlisted in the Army, and although he enlisted as a private, he then went through officer training school and became an officer. This also meant that he acquired his bachelor's degree while still in the Army. He served for 24 total years, and he retired with the rank of major. At some point during his career, possibly for the majority, he was actually an airborne sapper. So one of the things that he likes to quote is sappers clear the way airborne all the way. He had combat tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and he also won a number of medals and awards. After his retirement from the military, Ojeda taught JRTC from 2013 until 2017, and what that is is a high school level version of ROTC, which helps prepare young people to go in the military and sort of know how it works, what the organization is like, all of that kind of stuff. He did get his bachelor's in general education from West Virginia State, which interestingly enough is a historically black college. Later on, I think after he left the military, he earned a master's in business and organizational security from Webster University. In addition to teaching JROTC, Ojeda also got involved in community activism. Right after he retired, he helped to establish a social services organization nonprofit called Logan Empowerment Action and Development. This group focuses on community cleanup, Christmas toy drives, meals for the needy, and gathering money for kids' shoes. West Virginia, like its neighbor Kentucky, has a long-standing reputation for having a level of poverty that is so grinding that many of the families in, uh, especially the rural parts of the state, cannot afford to buy new shoes for their children's feet. So Ojeda was responding to a local need. So that's why, although this seems a little weird to be one of the main focuses of this uh, group, it actually is something that was very relevant to the people in his particular community. So far as I know, Richard Ojeda had no political ambitions whatsoever prior to 2013. Now, he was a lifelong Democrat, but aside from voting and maybe occasionally knocking on doors or something like that, he was not the kind of person to run for office. But that all changed when he was invited to attend a speech by Senator Joe Manchin. During the speech, Ojeda was moved by a description of how unequal the distribution of manufacturing hubs were among the different regions of West Virginia. Now, how exactly Ojeda found himself being inspired by a right-wing corporate Democrat like Manchin is beyond me, given what Ojeda's politics are, but this is based on his description of how it happened, so I assume it must be accurate. This inspired Ojeda to decide to run for the state Senate in order to fight corruption at the local level. So he began his political career uh, running for state office, 
and of course he met with some fairly heavy opposition since what he was proposing was fighting the corruption that was endemic in West Virginia politics. It was during his state senate run that Richard Ojeda showed that he had balls of steel. While he was running for state senate, Ojeda was brutally assaulted by a lifelong acquaintance using brass knuckles. This person apparently lured Ojeda to some sort of lonely place and asked him to put an Ojeda bumper sticker on his truck. He waited for Ojeda to bend over, then he pulled out some brass knuckles and started beating on him. Anyway, um, someone happened upon them while this beating was going on and Ojeda was saved. He had eight broken bones in his face, so this beating was severe. While he can't exactly prove it, Ojeda does suspect that his opponents in the race put this guy up to it, or some of the moneyed interest in West Virginia. And despite his family's pleas that he just let the issue go, Ojeda persisted, he stayed in the race, and he eventually emerged victorious. This reminds me of sort of a real life example of walking tall. There's a movie version with Joe Don Baker and a movie version with The Rock. They should also make another version, but with Richard Ojeda, because he literally did live through something that would fit right in with that storyline. At any rate, um, whatever else you might say about him, I don't think anyone can deny that Ojeda has some legitimate courage and that he is not easily intimidated. Going into the 2018 cycle, Ojeda decided to get involved in national politics. He ran in the West Virginia 3rd Congressional District against Republican incumbent Carol Miller, or as he calls her, Carol Miller. In 2016, Miller had won overwhelmingly. Her district is heavily Republican. However, Ojeda attacked Miller on taking money from Big Pharma and profiting off of the opioid epidemic. He ended up losing by 12 points. However, he improved upon the previous Democratic candidate's performance in 2016 by 36 points. And that 36 point closing of the gap represents the biggest swing to the Democrats in any race in all of 2018. So this means two things. Ojeda is a very good campaigner, and he has the ability to appeal to Republican voters, especially in West Virginia. When we see a lot of focus groups and they show people Ojeda ads, Democrats, you know, are fairly comfortable with him, 50-50-ish, and Republicans absolutely love him, despite the fact that he is campaigning as a progressive when it comes to policy. So he is a fascinating and potentially potent candidate. Many of the new 2018 candidates came into the national spotlight, and Ojeda was one of four Democrats who became fairly famous despite running losing races. The other ones, of course, being Beto O'Rourke, who thinks he's going to be president, Stacey Abrams, and Andrew Gillum. Ojeda has taken some heat for voting for Trump in 2016. However, the reasons that he gives for voting for Trump line up with what many progressives thought would happen with the white working class when Hillary Clinton decided to run a campaign devoid of any economic message whatsoever. Ojeda basically said, look, yeah, we kind of all knew that Trump was full of shit, but he did say that he might bring jobs back or keep us in our jobs for a little longer. So we felt like we had no choice but to vote for Trump. He then appeared in Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 11.9, which is sort of this uh, examination of how Trump won the election. And I think that Ojeda stole the show in that movie. Um, the segments with him are by far the most entertaining, and his charisma and intensity really comes across, but in a positive way. The Young Turks Network has really fallen in love with Ojeda. Uh, Cenk Uger probably once or twice a week will give an Ojeda quote. They also like to bring him in for interviews. Um, Ojeda was associated with Justice Democrats because he refuses to take any PAC money or lobbyist money, and he is in favor of Medicare for all. Among YouTube progressives, he's not really considered presidential timber. However, a lot of channels like Secular Talk will mention Ojeda and give him some favorable coverage. And because of the reach of TYT and a lot of these bigger progressive YouTube channels, 
Ogena is actually a relatively well-known quantity at this point. Um, that's not to say that he has the sort of clout of a major candidate, but he's still one of the most high-profile West Virginia politicians, certainly. And that's pretty impressive, considering that the highest office that he's ever held is that of state senator. So what are Ojeda's actual political stances? Well, he describes himself as a moderate who eschews labels. However, for the most part, if we look at where he stands on key issues, he seems most like a left-wing populist. I would primarily define someone as left or right based on their economic views, and by that metric, he is clearly on the left. However, before we go any further, I think it is worth noting that on some issues, he's either in the middle or somewhat on the right. Keep in mind, he is from West Virginia. He is probably a big believer in guns, and he is also somewhat in the middle when it comes to environmental issues. He has expressed support for the Green New Deal, but he has reservations at the same time. So he's sort of center left on that issue. However, there's one issue where he is clearly to the left of anyone else in American politics, and that is his stance on lobbyists and how to fight corruption. What he wants to do is force lobbyists to wear body cameras when they meet with government officials, so that way the public will know exactly what transpires behind closed doors. He supports Wolfpack, the organization dedicated to removing money from politics. So no more fundraising from private donors. Everyone would rely on public funding for their campaigns. He wants to limit the net worth of cabinet members to a million dollars. So if you wanted to hold a cabinet position and you were a multimillionaire, you'd have to give away the bulk of your wealth in order to do it. And he wants to create a pension system for retired officials of $120,000 adjusted annually for inflation. That way there's no incentive to uh, buddy up with corporations while you're in office so then you can leave the office and get a big cushy position on an executive board somewhere. Now, his positions on uh, these issues of lobbying and corruption are pretty radical, but they're also probably effective. Um, this is something that really would put a dent in sweetheart deals for, uh, for corporations. So I think that uh, hopefully Ojeda's ideas will eventually catch on somewhere. Anyhow, uh, he also has a lot of uh, sort of standard progressive uh, positions. He supports Medicare for all. He is a big believer in unions, which is something that um, so many Democrats are very weak on, but Ojeda is pretty strong on that. He supports increased teachers pay. He actually partook in the West Virginia teachers strike, and he was one of their most outspoken supporters. He is in favor of abortion, although he, for whatever reason, describes his position as pro-life. He is in favor of a woman's right to choose. He also is in favor of national marijuana legalization. So, by and large, he is a left populist, although, like I said, there are a few caveats to be aware of, such as his position on environmental issues. That being said, let's look at how his 2020 presidential run actually unfolded. With the possible exception of Andrew Yang, Ojeda was the first Democrat to announce his candidacy for the presidency. On November 12, 2018, right after the midterm election, Ojeda decided to run for president. Now, he had just run a good race, he had performed more strongly than any other Democrat despite his loss, and he had a national profile, so I guess he figured that if he got started early, he could offset some of his disadvantage in resources and name recognition, and hopefully he would build momentum and take off. After only 11 weeks, however, Ojeda was gaining no traction and not really drawing any support. His announcement was probably too early, and I think the major problem was that sympathetic progressives, such as myself, for example, tend to see him as underqualified to actually be president. So while I really like Richard Ojeda, I just can't imagine him at this juncture serving in the White House. Um, in the future, when he's got more experience, perhaps, but for now, I really just can't see it. After only 11 weeks, Richard Ojeda announced his decision to drop out on Facebook on January 26th of 2019. 
The reason for him quitting is that he just wasn't able to attract network coverage or raise money, and he didn't have any personal wealth that he could draw on to keep his campaign going while he waited to get his big break. He also didn't want to keep getting donations from common people when his odds of winning were so poor. He didn't want poor people to be pissing away their money into a lost cause. And actually his self-awareness on this issue is quite admirable. We live in an age where politicians are so hubristic that they rarely, if ever, understand that they have no chance. And they will continue to waste everyone's time in a race. Ojeda, however, he's at least a realist. So all the credit in the world on this. The lesson that he says that he learned is that you need to be wealthy to run for president. I think that he is quite correct, and I'm actually somewhat surprised that he didn't know that before. However, you know, I will give him credit for learning something important. Let's move on. Oddly enough, about two weeks before he ended up pulling the plug on his presidential campaign, Ojeda decided to resign his Senate seat in order to focus all of his attention on running for president. After he dropped out, he came back on January 26, 2019, and asked to be reinstated in the state Senate. The Senate Majority Leader, the, who was a Republican, did not move to have his resignation rescinded, and while this process was ongoing, Governor Jim Justice appointed a lobbyist to fill Ojeda's seat. If you look at Jim Justice's face, you will see what looks like a stereotypical comic book villain from the robber baron age. And um, I can't help but think that maybe Ojeda is looking to get a little revenge. So that leads us to our next question. What's next for Richard Ojeda? He's been screwed out of his state Senate seat and he will not be in the running for president in 2020. So what does the future hold for Major Ojeda? One quick caveat. It is still too early to know exactly what Ojeda will do. I'm sure that his experience running for president and failing so hard had to hurt, but um, it's been a couple months and I'm sure in a few more months we'll hear back from Ojeda about his intentions. I can't imagine him going away. I think that he will continue to be a factor in West Virginia politics. One thing that I will go ahead and rule out is that because of the strong interest that most Democrats have in representation on the ticket. I don't think that he'll be in the running for vice president. I would say that he's remotely possible, but I don't think it's something that's even worth considering at this point unless one of the candidates decide that they need a white male from rural America for whatever reason. However, um, he really is someone who should stick around because he's got a base of support that he could use to get some fairly major offices. He also has energy, charisma, and his relative success against Carol Miller show that he's a strong campaigner and that he has viability, at least in West Virginia. His status as a TYT favorite means that he can keep up a limited national profile and also raise some money from out of state to offset the powers that be in West Virginia coal country. There are two options that I see open for him, both of which would be quite good for him. One is his old buddy, Jim Justice. He is up for election in 2020, so Ojeda could run against him and possibly gain his revenge and the governor's mansion. And West Virginia is in bad need of reforms, so Ojeda's presence as governor would probably accomplish a lot of good. And in fact, if I were advising him, this is what I would tell him to do. The other option, which I think is also pretty solid, is that the Republican senator from West Virginia, Shelley Moore Capito, is also up for re-election in 2020. So if he wants to get involved in national politics and go to Washington, if we want to see Mr. Ojeda goes to Washington, he should run for the Senate. I think that in both cases, he has a better shot than any known Democrat. And I think he should go for it. But again, I don't know if he necessarily will. We'll see, though. At any rate, I predict that he will run for one of these two seats that I'm laying out here.
That's all I have to say about Richard Ojeda. I'll be back in the near future to talk about O'Rourke, uh, Hickenlooper, Yang, and the rest of the 2020 gang.